Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the Prospect Heights Public Libraries program today. I'm Terry Campbell, your host. Um, before we do our program today and celebrate Earth Day and Earth Week, I want to let you know about a program we have Sunday celebrating April is Jazz Appreciation Month. So we have a jazz band coming on Sunday at two o'clock. So please join us for that. There are still some good seats available. Today's Nature Speaks is in partnership with the Prospect Heights Natural Resource Commission. So we thank them for the partnership. And we are recording the program. And if you want to see it again, it'll be available on our calendar starting on Monday. If you have questions during the program and you're on Zoom, please put them in chat. If you're in the library's event room, please hold on to them and we'll get to them at the end of the program. So we want to welcome Executive Director of Scotland, the Big Picture, Peter Carnes, all the way from Scotland. Hi, Peter. Good, well, I was gonna say good evening. It's good evening for me, but I think it's good morning or good afternoon for you guys. Yes, it's good afternoon here. Thank you for joining us. Okay, you just want me to kick off, Terry? Absolutely, let's get going, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. thanks very much indeed for asking me along. Um, yeah, it's evening here in the Scottish Highlands, beautiful spring evening. Um, I'm gonna be clearly talking about um, rewilding, it, specifically in Scotland, um, but I hope that the principles that exist here, um, a lot of the messaging that revolves around the rewilding space in Scotland is, is applicable everywhere. It's not a Scottish thing, I suppose that's what I'm trying to say. And the other thing before I start, just by way of a quick sort of technology uh, red flag, there is one and a bit videos in this. I'm not sure how that's going to carry across the Atlantic. If it doesn't work for you, I apologize, but it is only about one and a half, two minutes. So just by way of a quick introduction, um, as Terry said, my name is Peter Cairns. I uh, represent Scotland Big Picture. We're a small charity. We're a team of about 20 and we work to drive the recovery of nature across Scotland through rewilding in response to the growing climate and biodiversity crises. Now you guys, um, I don't know you of course, but I'm sure you're all really very nice people. So I hope you don't take this next bit personally, but I'd really rather not be giving this talk if truth be told. Um, I'd rather my job didn't exist. I'd rather that Scotland, the big picture didn't exist. But one of the reasons it does exist Okay, so one of the reasons that uh, Scotland Big Picture does exist is this number. Now, around uh, 10 years ago now, um, about 220 countries worldwide were measured for their biodiversity intactness, the, the completeness of their nature, if you like. 218 countries measured, and this is where the UK ranked. We're one of the wealthiest, best educated countries in the world and yet somehow we've become one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. And so one of the reasons that Scotland the Big Picture does exist, so the reason that Scotland the Big Picture does exist, the, the reason that rewilding is even a word is the degree to which dewilding has, has ravaged this country. And this message of, of nature depletion in a, in a modern progressive country like Scotland, it, it comes as a shock to many people. And this is why. This is a, a, a globally recognized view. This is the Kerrang on the Isle of Skye, the cliched Scotland, the idealized Scotland, the Scotland that is presented to the world, of course, on all those glossy tourist brochures. And I've stood many a time at the Kerrang and listened to the people around me marvel at the view. And it is one hell of a view. For most people, this iconic landmark symbolizes what Scotland looks like, what they feel Scotland should look like. But what they don't see, okay. So people stood at the Kerrang. What, what they don't see or, or perhaps won't see is that this geological wonder, like so many others across the UK has become an ecological vacuum. Gone are the complex woodlands that once shaped this land. Gone are many of the animals that once lived on the land and gone too are many of the people that once lived 
from the land. Despite their unquestionable beauty and drama, many of Scotland's glens, rivers and mountains are devoid of the complex living systems that they once supported. These vast, empty landscapes have been simplified, dismantled, and today many of them lie muted by centuries of burning, felling, draining and overgrazing. As a society, we suffer from a condition that we refer to as ecological blindness. We simply don't see the degraded landscapes and the animals we've lost because we're not conditioned to look. We perceive a landscape of natural beauty because we're told that's what it is. That's the story that we're sold. And that notion is, is kept alive by a, a sort of generational amnesia whereby each new generation accepts as normal the landscapes they're born into, irrespective of how impoverished they may be. But the truth is that in relatively recent history, we've lost all our large carnivores, most of our large herbivores. Scotland holds on to just fragments and threads, 82 tiny islands of natural woodland, native woodland, covering just three or four percent of their original range. Many species that were once prolific now teeter on the edge. We've arrived at a point where we celebrate, cherish, and bizarrely even pay to actively conserve degraded landscapes over a massive scale that support just a few species and just a few people. We believe it doesn't have to be this way. We believe there's a solution and it's called rewilding. So what is rewilding? Well, I think it's fair to say, certainly in the UK, if you ask 100 people, you'll get 100 different answers. Everyone has an opinion on rewilding and the change that they think it might bring about. And of course, um, again, I can't comment for the US, but certainly here in their quest for sensationalism and conflict, the popular media would have us believe that it's all about reinstating wolves and driving farmers off their land. So you read all of these lurid headlines. So definitions do vary. But for us, this is rewilding, an evolving process of nature recovery that leads to restored ecosystem health, function and completeness. In essence, what that means is that we'd like to see hundreds of thousands of Scottish acres that presently look something like this transformed into acres that look more like this. More trees, more flowers, more insects, more fish, more birds and mammals, and ultimately more people living healthy, fulfilling lives as part of vibrant communities. Rewilding is an opportunity to restore abundance and diversity of life to our degraded ecosystems so that they work in all their colorful complexity. It's an opportunity to stitch back together a tapestry of life where natural processes drive vibrant living systems. Processes like predator-prey dynamics, like carcass scavenging, birth, death, decay, regeneration. These are the processes that drive every healthy living system on the planet. Rewilding is about encouraging rivers shaded by corridors of alder and willow to run as they want to, as they need to, allowing natural debris like fallen trees to accumulate in river channels, enriching the water for insects and bird life, creating pools for rivers full of salmon and trout. Rewilding is about connectivity across the landscape, encouraging native woodland to expand and regulate our climate, allowing animals freedom to roam, creating wildlife corridors for red squirrels to move from tree to tree. And rewilding is recognizing that a forest, for example, is much more than just a sea of trees. It's a complex community of soil microbes, lichens, mosses, tall trees, tiny trees, dead and dying trees, all coming together in a constantly evolving system. Rewilding is about re-wetting, restoring Scotland's peatlands that across huge areas have been drained and burned, giving them a chance to purify our water, store carbon, as well as providing sanctuary for some of our most spectacular wildlife. At its most basic level, rewilding is anything that counteracts more dewilding, anything that joins up and enriches habitats rather than further fragment and degrade them. Anything that results in more nature and not less nature. 
And ultimately, rewilding is standing back and letting nature, letting natural processes shape and govern the landscape, letting natural process, processes dictate, letting nature have its own way, plot its own course, do its own thing. Ultimately, rewilding is about letting go. And this is where it starts to get uncomfortable for some people. So, um, yeah, people, people are often threatened by the prospect of, of change, especially when they feel that that change is being done to them. And they're also threatened by the, the sense uh, that control over their land and arguably therefore their destiny is being wrestled away from them. And if you think about it, that's completely understandable. For centuries, people have been exerting control over every square inch of this country and all the species within it. We've, we've made it work for the benefit of just one species, us. So the concept of, of ceding or relinquishing control to any other animal is, is except ourselves, is, is threatening to many people. And these fears all stem from our belief systems, our values, values that are shaped by our parents, our education, our social background, our peer groups, even our religious persuasions. These things all shape what we believe to be right and wrong, who we are and what we stand for. Rewilding is seen by many as a transformational approach to addressing the dual crises of climate breakdown and global nature loss. It presents or represents a, a positive pathway to a future much richer in nature. But for others, the word itself is off-putting, somehow suggesting a backward step. The concept of wildness to some people is troublesome, implying an uncultivated, inhospitable, and crucially, uninhabited state. So whatever rewilding might mean, there are people out there who are sure that they don't like it. Sometimes people say to me, you know, it must be great having a job working in beautiful landscapes with sexy wildlife species. And I say, yeah, absolutely. That, that must be great. But that's not what I do. For the most part, my work is with just one species, this one. Because this is the species that holds the key to the rewilding door. The practical idea of rewilding on the ground is a relatively simple one. And yet the social and cultural landscapes it must navigate are anything but simple. The recovery of nature in the UK rests with people. It's 20% ecology and 80% psychology. So the battleground for rewilding, if indeed there is one, is for people's hearts and minds. My own sort of hearts and minds story, if you like, goes back ooh, 25 years or so when I worked as a photojournalist and I came over to your part of the world to cover the story of the reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone. And over a number of visits, I spoke to tens, if not hundreds of people, hunters, ranchers, scientists, researchers, tourism operators, and just normal families about their views on wolves. And what was interesting is that very quickly, common themes emerged. Very quickly, conversations were no longer about wolves, but about how people frame wolves in their minds. For many Americans, reintroducing wolves was simply a matter of writing an historic wrong. But others resented their return, of course, feeling that these animals were being imposed on rural communities, that those communities were being robbed of the power to make their own decisions and shape their own destinies. The return of wolves was seen by some as an affront on the very identity of rural America. And as I've traveled to different parts of the world, exploring this fascinating and bewildering and ultimately frustrating relationship between people and nature. That same narrative has played out again and again and again. Wolves in America, bears in Finland, hen harriers in Scotland, beavers in Scotland, red deer in Scotland. The backdrop and the characters might change, but the social and the cultural story remains pretty much the same. The ranchers I spoke with in the US they didn't necessarily hate wolves as such, but they resented the challenge to their custodianship of the land. They rallied against the people far away in city offices who they didn't know, who they didn't trust, but who were nevertheless making decisions that threatened their way of life. As I said earlier, the popular media, certainly here in, in the UK, often reduces 
rewilding into a simple debate over large predators or deer numbers or grouse moors. And these components are all part of the story, but we have to get past this and diffuse this notion that rewilding has to be a choice between the needs of nature and those of people. We need to create solutions that work for both. So ultimately, rewilding asks us all to think differently, to reconsider our place in the natural order as just one species among many. Rewilding is as much a change in mindset as it is a physical change for the land or the sea. So this landscape, it might be familiar, it might be comfortable, it might even be a symbol of our control over nature. But against that backdrop of climate breakdown and global nature loss, I think we would argue that we need to see this landscape through a different lens. We need to be cured of our ecological blindness. So why is rewilding needed? Well, lots of reasons, that figure of 189 at the beginning for a start, but more broadly, the truth is that traditional conservation has failed to arrest and reverse ecological decline. There's a favorite saying by a, an American actually called Doug Chadwick. He's a, a wildlife biologist. Some of you might know him. He says the essence of nature is wholeness, a wholeness woven from infinite complexity. Trying to save nature piece by piece doesn't make sense, even if we had all the time in the world, and we most certainly do not. And yet, for the last 20, 30, 40 years, conservationists have been trying to save nature piece by piece. Red squirrels, corncrakes, capercaillie, water voles, wildcats, brown hares, seabirds. At one time or another, we've had a go at saving them all. A rare species here, a fragment of habitat there. And there have been successes, there's no doubt about that. The return of pine martins in the last couple of decades shows what can be achieved. And all that we've done with pine martins is stop killing them and giving them and giving them somewhere better to live. But despite these isolated successes across Scotland, that wholeness that Doug Chadwick re referred to remains broken. We seem unable to acknowledge that we're all bound up in an intricate web of life that ties us to the weather, the atmosphere, the seas, the soil, the flowers and the trees, and every other living creature on the planet. This is what conservation looks like in Scotland. Fenced reserves that are often designed to protect individual species, almost to hold them in stasis, rather than to set free the processes such as predation, scavenging, birth, death, decay and regeneration, the processes that drive every healthy living system on the planet. We need to get past this. We need to restore the whole. We need to see the big picture. Another reason why we need rewilding is that for centuries we've been pitching our economic system in direct competition with our ecological systems. And the truth is that nature is losing in a war with our insatiable appetite for economic growth. In my lifetime, the number of wild animals living on the planet has halved. The number of people has trebled. Our climate is changing. And the natural systems that underpin our very existence are under threat. So actually, this is not about pine martins or pine trees or I don't know, pine harbor flies. This is about us. And if not our survival, then certainly our well being. And well being is really critical in this discussion. We need wildness in our lives. There's now a growing body of compelling evidence that links a detachment from nature to a whole host of both physical and mental conditions, especially among young people. And there's a wider moral issue at work here too. We've stripped our forests, we've drained our wetlands, we've eliminated many species that once lived here. These are all things that we now quite understandably condemn in other countries and yet we sit in judgment on those countries, our moral integrity summed up by that figure of 189. There's no doubt that Scotland is a land of incredible shape and form but pretending all is well Believing those glossy tourist brochures is ignoring the evidence. And in our view, doing nothing isn't an option. So 
if rewilding is such a good thing, then why isn't it happening across more of Scotland? Well, bit by bit, it is. I hope that traveled reasonably well across the Atlantic, at least enough to give you the, the gist of it. So this is Cairngorms Connect, a wild landscape in the making. Britain's biggest habitat restoration initiative, a 200 year vision to restore 600 square kilometers of forest, peatland, loch and river right at the heart of the Cairngorms National Park. And this is Glen Feshy, literally just about three miles from where I'm sitting uh, this evening. This is a landscape that is in transition and after centuries of intense management, predominantly for grouse shooting and deer stalking, this landscape is being allowed to breathe, to recover, to start to govern itself. Nature being allowed back on its own terms. And I can remember 30 years ago when these old pines on the valley floor had no neighbours, but now they do. Sprightly youngsters, young trees popping up next to their parents and grandparents. After decades of being more or less absent, hen harriers are returning to breed. Golden eagles are breeding without fear of persecution. Piece by piece, the jigsaw of life is being put back together. The rare, the common, the spectacular, the barely visible. This is Abernethy Forest, about 20 miles north of where I'm sitting. Again, part of the Cairngorms Connect area. Here, Highland cattle are being used to replicate the grazing patterns of lost herbivores. Plantations of Scots pine, conifers, are being restructured, effectively beaten up to create more complexity. And as we know, nature loves complexity. It hates simplicity. Standing deadwood is being created so that there's a home for woodpeckers and crested tits. If I literally jump over the mountains outside my office window, we come to Mar Lodge on D side. And again, huge areas are being given over to nature recovery for the first time in decades, if not centuries. Again, native woodland is regenerating. Peatland restoration is gathering momentum. We now know, of course, that healthy peatlands store more carbon than tropical rainforests. So if we can get these natural giant sponges effectively functioning effectively, they'll soak up huge amounts of water and huge amounts of carbon. And the great thing about peatland rewilding is that we know it works and it works quickly. This is an aerial image taken at Mar Lodge just three weeks after some of the drains were blocked that were previously drying out the peat. So we're now seeing peatland as a not as a, as a commodity, but as an ally in climate change. Afric Highlands is another landscape scale initiative combining nature recovery, climate mitigation, 
and the development of new opportunities for local communities. Ditto, Craig Meggy in Loch Arbor, Allerdale in Sutherland, Ben A, Wester Ross, and Koyach and Assent in the northwest of Scotland. These are all amazing projects and their visions span decades, if not centuries. This is not a quick job. Well, what about the smaller land holdings that make up our landscape? Well, three years ago, we were approached by three farmers, all, almost out of the blue, who said to us, this is great, we love this rewilding, how do we do it? And if I'm honest, we, we were unable to offer them a, a coherent answer, but that was the catalyst for what has now become the Northwoods Rewilding Network. And if you fast forward three years, those farmers, those three farmers, have now turned into almost 60 land partners, comprising farms, crofts, small estates, community land holdings, a series of ecological stepping stones across the country. And we designed Northwoods in a, in a way that has a few unique elements. Firstly, one of the founding principles was to make rewilding more accessible, more democratic, to dispel the notion that it was only something for wealthy landowners or big conservation groups. So our land partners all have land holdings between 100 and 1,000 acres, still pretty big, but not on the scale of Cairngorms Connect or Africa Highlands. Secondly, we recognize that in many situations, ecological recovery is only possible, or it's certainly easier if it works in tandem with local communities. So we combine, yeah, so we combine, we try to combine rewilding with the development of sustainable nature-based enterprise so that we can make rewilding an economically viable land use choice. And the third element of Northwoods really is people power. Um, this is the rewilding dashboard for what was achieved across the network during 2022. So 56 land partners collectively achieved all of these things. That's effectively 56 rewilding teams on the ground doing stuff, delivering impact. So harnessing people power is key to the success of the network. And this is what people power looks like. Just a few examples. This is a friend of mine, Balan Lagan, about 40 miles away from here. Just two years ago, this was sterile sheep pasture, but the owners have planted nearly 10,000 native trees, created this wetland, which now looks like this, and has breeding lapwing and curlew. In 10 years, what was an ecological dead space will be full of life. This is wetland restoration going on at another Northwoods partner. And the focus here is on creating more space for water. This is one of a series of ponds that now look like this. And quite a number of our Northwoods sites have um, installed what we call, I, I don't know what it is in America, but we call them leaky dams. Um, you'll see what they look like and what they do when this time lapse runs. Um, but this is designed to slow the flow of water, create backwaters and ponds. You could argue quite legitimately, actually, that this is effectively uh, replicating the work of, of beavers. Um, but certainly in this part of the world, we don't have beavers yet. So this is the next best thing. But again, you can see the impact that it's having in just a matter of an hour or so. You get this uh, this backup of, of water and you've got more space for water. So, yeah, I'll let that finish off. This is um, a place called Leadburn Community Woodland um, down near Edinburgh. Uh, this is native woodland regeneration going on here. This is uh, a, a little bit of a, a what we call burn rewiggling, if you like. This is or, or re meandering of a straightened river ditch, again, to create more space for water, uh, lock up carbon, give more uh habitat for species like salmon we've erected or oh, i don't know countless osprey app platforms and, and eagle iris this one is a place called banff in perthshire and this is a guy called duncan lawson working to improve habitat connectivity in his land holding by removing fencing and again more fencing coming out at ardna keg and argyles this is david stewart working with his highland cattle fitted with these no fence collars which allows us to remove unnecessary fencing. So just a very quick snapshot of the type of restoration work that is going on. 
So what about Northwoods moving forward? Well, we've just gone into phase two, which takes us to the end of 2026. And during that time, we hope to num double the number of land partners to 120, covering around 60,000 acres. We're looking at some really cool projects. They're cool for us. You guys might have seen this uh, already. I mean, you use bison. This is effectively um, our, our surrogate, if you like, for bison, a, a, a species called oryx or at least a, a backbred version of that. So we're really excited about working on reintroducing large herbivores across the landscape as they are being done, as, as is happening across um, Europe. Funding all of these actions, of course, remains a, a priority, priority, and we're working with a growing number of corporates to secure responsible investment in nature recovery. This is the fund we use to do this. This is a ring fenced pot of money that helps our land partners realize their rewilding ambitions. And we're also working on a thing called rewilding impact tokens. I won't bore you with the detail of that. I'm not sure I fully understand it, to be honest, but it will attract broader investment into nature recovery from the private sector. And finally, something that's really important to us, we, we believe passionately in the power of storytelling, communications to help turn the tide for nature recovery. So showcasing the successes of our Northwoods partners is really important. And we use forward-looking positive narratives that allows us to demonstrate how rewilding looks and it works and the benefits it can deliver at different scales and across different settings. Most of what I've spoken about so far, I guess, revolves around habitat restoration, restoring the stage, if, if you like. But where are the actors? Well, in 1954, ospreys returned to breed in Scotland after being persecuted to extinction. And I think this was something of a turning point in Scottish conservation history. Since then, species like red kites and white-tailed eagles have been reintroduced, and they're now breeding in places where they've not been seen in generations. Badgers and otters are bouncing back, and pine martens are expanding after centuries of habitat loss and persecution. But this brings us to a critical junction, I believe, with our future relationship with nature. I regularly have people now telling me there are too many pine martens, there are too many badgers, too many otters, buzzards, seals, cormorants, too many inconvenient, undesirable, unpalatable species, too many bad animals, in inverted commas. But what does too many actually mean? When I ask those people how many pine martens there are, nobody knows, but there are too many. I think what too many usually means for most people is more than they used to be, more than they can remember in their lifetime. And it takes us back to ecological blindness, ecological illiteracy, it's lazy thinking. And if as a society we agree that we cannot save nature piece by piece. And I think most people do agree with that now. If we accept that wholeness that Doug Chadwick referred to, we can't pick and choose the animals that we like or profit from. You've only got to go back 70 years, less than a human lifetime, and tens of thousands of red squirrels were killed as a bounty in, in Scotland. Now today, of course, everyone loves red squirrels. They're recognized as a, an integral part of our woodlands, but we're a fickle species and we make judgments about other species and their entitlement to share our space. And this is the latest animal that finds itself in the dock, in the crosshairs, if you like. There are 24 countries across Europe, most of them much more heavily populated than Scotland, all of which got on with returning beavers to their landscape. Germany now has 50,000 beavers, France, 20,000. And there are beavers back in Scotland, but it took 20 years. And to some people, they represent an imposition, a challenge to their custodianship of the land. And again, we're back to that fear of losing control. The UK is now one of just a handful of European countries refusing to live with lynx. It's not that we can't. There's plenty of food. There's plenty of habitat. It is that we won't. Large carnivores like lynx, like wolves, like bears are now spreading across mainland Europe. There are now wolves living in Italy, in Germany, in France, in Spain. There are now wolves living in the Netherlands of all places, one of the most densely populated countries 
on the planet. So it's not that we can't, it is that we won't. Endless research tells us that apex predators are essential to healthy ecosystems, but no more so than the tiniest of insects. It's the interaction and interdependency of all species that allows nature to work. But all species has to mean all species, not just those that we like or profit from. There are, of course, countries in the world where people along, live alongside animals that pose a genuine threat. We don't here in the UK, so the media invents them. Spiders are portrayed as terrifying home invaders. Red kites allegedly terrorise rural villages. Gulls trap people in their own homes. Even the plants are out to get us. Foxgloves and nettles are lurking in the countryside. The British public has become increasingly removed from nature. The countryside is something to be looked at and admired rather than lived in. And this disconnection has embedded a deep fear of many animals. And it's encouraged by a media that is addicted to headline grabbing hysteria. This ecological lit illiteracy I referred to earlier, this relentless demonization of our wildlife, it deepens our fears. It further alienates us from our place in the natural order. We've lost the psychological mindset to live alongside large wild animals. And of course, this discussion around missing species is not just one of ecolog ecological benefits. Across the world, charismatic animals are being used to brand nature-rich landscapes, because increasingly those landscapes and the animals that they contain are becoming significant economic drivers. As I said earlier, the, the popular media have a tendency to equate rewilding with wolves. And, and I've been prattling on for far too long now, thanks to the interruptions, I don't know, for 40 minutes or so. And I, I, I don't think I've actually mentioned the wolf word, or at least not many times. Um, and that's because rewilding is about so much more. And part of our job in driving support for rewilding is reinforcing that message. And our logo is rewilding for nature, for climate, but also for people. But all of that said, wolves are part of this story. And I'm going to wrap up with a, a passage that, that you guys might be familiar with, actually, but it's a favourite passage of mine written by Aldo Leopold, the American hunter turned conservationist. We were eating lunch on a high rim rock when we saw what we thought was a doe fording the torrent. When she climbed the bank towards us, we realised our error. It was a wolf. In those days, we'd never heard of passing up a chance to kill a wolf and in a few seconds we were pumping lead. When our rifles were empty, the old wolf was down. We reached her in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then, and have known ever since, that there was something new to me in those eyes. I was young back then and full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But after seeing that green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. That experience caused Leopold to rethink his relationship with the wild world, to reconsider the importance of predators in the balance of nature, almost a new dawn in his thinking. And this is what rewilding offers. It offers us the opportunity to rethink our relationship with the wild world, to think about our place within it and our reliance on it. I've never met anyone who would contest that Scotland is a spectacular country, but we can no longer bury our heads in the sand. Nature is in serious decline. And we're in the middle now of the United Nations decade on ecosystem restoration. This is the first time there's been a global movement to restore and recover our degraded living systems, rather than simply trying to protect the fragments and threads of nature that we have left. So rewilding is an ongoing conversation. Some people remain comfort uncomfortable with it, but there is no doubt that the appetite for rewilding is growing. And Scotland, the big picture, has, has never been in the business of telling people what to think. I hope that we're not that 
stupid or arrogant. But what we do ask, or we pose two questions really for those people who are who do remain skeptical about rewilding, but who are nevertheless concerned about the future for rural Scotland. And those two questions are, if not rewilding, then what? And if not now, then when? So I'm delighted to have struggled through that. Um, thank you very much indeed for bearing with me and for looking and listening. If you'd like to know more about our work, this is where you'll find us. We're on all the usual social media channels. Um, so thank you for your forbearance. Um, yeah, I'm a bit, it didn't go even worse than it did. Um, really, really sorry about it. No idea why, but uh, hopefully we got there in the end. So yeah, that's me. Thank you. So if you have questions, please put them in chat and I will be coming into the library event room to ask you if you have questions also. Hey, Peter, we have a lot of comments. Uh, thank you for a thoughtful presentation. What a wonderful presentation, beautiful pictures. Um, somebody would like to know what percentage of rewilding do you aim for? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and I suppose, I suppose there's no definitive answer, but but what I would say is that the organisations that we work with as part of an alliance in Scotland, our sort of headline, if you like, is 30% of Scottish land and seas managed under rewilding principles by 2030. So there's a few caveats and variants in that, but that's pretty much the headline, 30% by 2030. All right, and you might not know the answer to this question, but I'm curious, um, given King Charles has a passion for environmentalism and sustainability. How um, having him being king affects what you all are doing? Oh, you've, you've pressed a button there, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, why I asked. I, I'm imagining that some of this audience at least are, are, are quite um, pro our monarchy. Um, I won't go into my views, but 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 what I will say is that you're absolutely right. Um, King Charles quite likes to tell the rest of the world how they should behave uh, environmentally, and, and that's to be applauded. He has um, a big property in Scotland, Balmoral, that you'll be aware of, I'm sure, plus a couple of others. Um, all I will say is that I wish he practised what he preaches elsewhere. Um, we'll leave it at that. And I think it's a missed opportunity because there's no doubt that if he did decide to embark on a rewilding journey, whether he calls it rewilding or renaturing or whatever he wants to call it, it would set a trend in motion um, and others would undoubtedly follow. But at the moment, that's not happening and it's a missed opportunity. So um, I think the answer to your question is let's let's wait and see what happens in the next three or four years. OK, sounds good. Um, a question here, Peter, it seems that the economic aspect is a big part of the success. Would you agree? Can you talk about restoration tourism? Yeah, so I think one of the challenges, you know, the, the, the standoff really here in Scotland, and again, I'll perhaps reflect it back to Wolves in Yellowstone, is, it, it, I mean, it's, it's multifaceted, but, but one of the big questions that we get asked regularly is, this is all very well, but <clears throat> how does rewilding pay? How does how does the jobs of shepherds and gamekeepers and gillies and wardens be maintained against a rewilding backdrop? And it's a completely legitimate question. One of the answers to the question does lie with um, tourism related activities, and that, that involves a whole range of different things. But what, of course, is creeping up on the outside, and I don't know how well developed this is in the States, but is the payment for what we call natural capital, payment for ecosystem services. So that might, for example, be an insurance company that wants to um, minimize the chance of, of regular flooding in an upland town, for example. And rather than build concrete walls, they're now investing in peatland re uh, recovery or woodland recovery to slow the flow of water through the catchment. Others uh, have an environmental, other corporates have an environmental and social governance policy and increasingly are looking to invest in nature recovery or climate mitigation or community benefit or a combination thereof so the fact of the matter is that you know there are some people that consider jumping into bed with the private sector to be a, a sort of prostitution of values and I, and I kind of understand that but the reality is that the difference between 
in, uh, traditional income streams, public sector um, or, or philanthropy, and the amount of money that's needed to do that 30% is estimated about 20 billion pounds. So if we don't engage with the private sector, where is that money coming from? So that market, that that relationship, that marriage, call it what you will, is really in its infancy. It's really starting to evolve. But increasingly, we get calls from corporate corporate individuals saying, or corporate um, private sector uh, businesses saying, you know, what can we do? We're we're a, we're a polluting company. What can we do to mitigate or offset? Our emissions, or our, or 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 the negative impact that we have on on the environment. So I think that's the real opportunity. It needs to be handled sensitively. We need to make sure that it doesn't end up just being greenwashing. But in that mix, I think is a is a is a progressive way forward to pay for all of this stuff. There's one more question. Have you looked at Costa Rica to use their ecotourism ways? Yes, we've we've looked at many, many case studies across the world. Um, e ecotourism in Costa Rica is a good example. Um, there are many, many examples in, in the States and American Prairie might might be one that if you're not aware of would 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 deserve a look. Um, so I think, again, with with sustainable nature based tourism and that word sustainable is quite interesting and important. Um, there are some really good models. There are some really rapidly emerging models. And, and I think, you know, if you look across the world, we, we all know, we all share the challenge of climate breakdown. And it's really interesting how different people and different sectors are starting to address that. And the tourism sector is one, but there are many, many others all trying to address it in their own way. So I would say, you know, generally speaking, it's a glass half full and not a glass half empty. There remain huge challenges. I've spoken about some of them this evening, but the, the direction of travel, if you'd have offered this to me, 10 years ago, I'd have, I'd have snapped your hand off. So there's a lot of really positive work going on. That was the last question on Zoom. Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Before everybody goes, I wanna let you know our next Nature Speaks is going to be in July on Wednesday, July 19th at seven o'clock. And we have invited Grace Hart, who is a beekeeper and a bee expert, and she'll be talking about saving the bees. So uh, that is also a very important uh, challenge we have. So join us for that. Thank you for uh, your patience again. And thank you, Peter, for your presentation. And thank you everybody for joining us today for our Nature Speaks in partnership with the Prospect Heights Nature Natural Resources Commission. And if you ever wanna get out into nature and volunteer, they're always looking for volunteers. So have a good evening, everyone. Thank you again, Peter. Thank you, guys. Thanks for your patience. Good day.